Many of the people I talk to about climate change, many of the students I work with, assume that the main reasons we find it hard to do anything about this problem are our myopia, our inability to cooperate, and our general selfishness. So this paper asks the very simple question, what if, from now on, we assume that everyone acts in, with sort of rational collective self-interest and cooperates perfectly, what temperature do we end up at? What I've done is combine some very standard tools from macroeconomics with some recent findings about the global carbon cycle and the climate system to reach some, what to me, were fairly surprising conclusions. So economists have been arguing for years that it doesn't make sense to say we'll spare no expense to reduce emissions. Reducing emissions comes at a cost. Initially, that cost could be quite low. Better home insulation, for example, virtually pays for itself. But as we reduce emissions, the cost of making one more ton of CO2 saving goes up and up as we start to hit up against applications of fossil carbon which are more and more valuable. Things like cement manufacturing or many forms of transport fuels for which there is no cost-effective substitute. The new element in this paper is if we take into account the fact that carbon dioxide accumulates in the climate system, so every tonne of carbon you dump into the atmosphere remains there, affecting the climate effectively forever, then we find if the cost of reducing emissions goes up and up continuously, we never actually find it cost-effective to reduce emissions to zero. So the world will warm forever. Now there's two reasons why that rather bleak scenario might not play out. First of all, future generations might decide to reduce emissions faster than a cold-hearted cost-benefit analysis would indicate. They might decide to be more self-sacrificial than we are, a lot more. But it's hard to justify basing current climate policy on the assumption that they will be so much nicer than us. So the second really important reason why the world probably won't warm forever is eventually it'll become cost-effective to literally trap CO2 back out of the atmosphere and dispose of it than to leave it in the atmosphere and allow it to continue to harm the climate. And because of this, because that process, trapping CO2 back out of the atmosphere, plays such an important role in determining when the warming will stop, when emissions will stop, that's a critical parameter in determining what level temperatures reach. The critical importance of carbon capture and disposal technology has been noted before, but what this analysis shows is that that technology or technologies building on that will remain critical under all scenarios because it's the only way of actually getting emissions to zero. Imagine a world where carbon dioxide emissions are going down and down towards zero but still haven't reached there. We're going to reach a stage where we don't even know where the carbon dioxide is being emitted. It'll be being emitted by some rogue state somewhere over which we have no control. Under those circumstances, we have two options. We can either move in and enforce a global ban on the use of fossil carbon, which would be horrendously expensive if you think about it, or we could deploy carbon capture and disposal technology in order to get rid of the CO2 back out of the air. And overwhelmingly, the second option is going to be far more far cheaper and more cost-effective than the first. The reason this matters is that of the billions being spent on trying to combat climate change at the moment, at only a tiny fraction can be considered relevant to developing and reducing the cost of getting rid of CO2. So we're investing huge amounts in subsidising renewable and nuclear energy, which substitute for some uses of fossil carbon, but they don't provide a route to net zero. And we're not investing in the one technology that we will need to get to zero. This does not mean, of course, that all the money we spend on subsidising substitutes for fossil energy is necessarily wasted, but it does provide us with a way of looking critically at those investments to decide which are really helping reduce peak warming and which are not. The crucial ratio that comes out of this analysis is what we call the carbon intensity of growth. Um, think about the ratio between growth of the economy, that's typically globally around 3% per year, and the rate of emissions. At the moment, that's about getting on for 40 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. If you've got a technology that can reduce global emissions by 1%, but it costs so much to deploy that subsidising it actually reduces global growth 
by more than 1%, then actually deploying that technology has a negative impact on peak warming. Because what it does is it reduces the ability and willingness of future generations to invest in re reducing emissions to zero. The nice thing about this paper is that it distills the climate policy problem down into two very simple numbers. First, the cost of the backstop technology, the cost of getting emissions down to zero. I find in this paper with current estimates of climate system parameters that unless that cost can be got below $200 per tonne of CO2, the chances of future generations deciding it was even worth their while to stabilize temperatures below two degrees are relatively slight. So we need to invest in finding out what the cost of that backstop is and invest in reducing it. Second, it shows that we need to maintain growth in a carbon constrained world. So we need to maximize the amount of economic growth we can get out of the emissions we allow ourselves at the moment. And this gives us a new tool with which to evaluate measures to reduce emissions in the shorter term.